Good evening. All right. Welcome to the Living Water live stream Bible study. My name is Bernardine Wormley Daniels, and it is my pleasure to be with you on tonight. Praise God. We're going to give people um, just a little bit of time to um, log in and uh, join us. Praise God. We will be continuing where we left off last week. Um, we've, we're talking about deliverance, praise God. So you're going to have to dig out your notes from last week. I didn't repost them. Um, if you just flip back on my, on my page, you can find them. They should still be posted out there on my Facebook page. So welcome, welcome. Um, it's always a blessing to um, be with you and to um, break open the word of life and begin to drink from rivers of living water. Amen. That's the name of the Bible study, Living Water Bible Study. I've been doing the Living Water Bible Study since, oh my God, since I was pregnant with my son and whew, he's 31. So it's been a long time doing this Bible study. So good evening to uh, my Canadian friends, praise God. I think I'm going to be back over in Canada um, beginning in January sometime. I got to look at my calendar. I think I'm supposed to be coming over there. Um, God willing, and they don't close the border because <laughs> I'm one of the unvaccinated people. Um, so hopefully they won't uh, change it and I can still get over into Canada and back. Good evening to my friend Loretta and to my friend Donna. Um, good evening, Gwendolyn, all my peeps are logging in. Good evening, Catherine, praise God. Oh, Catherine, I, you know, I, um, I have a, well, I didn't mean to eliminate the rest of y'all and just talk directly to Catherine, but in my um, home fellowship, the new community of faith that we're forming, we just started um, doing some, we're reading in John and, um, trying to receive an impartation from him on what it means to abide in Christ. But we just started some prophetic training. So I just um, registered for Emma Starks has like an online um, prophetic authority class and I'm taking it. And um, so far it's good. So they also have a group version. That's why I started talking to Catherine because I think I might uh, purchase the group version and have my um, group um, join me in it on um, Saturdays. We can do it together. All right, praise God. Good evening to um, Sally and um, another one of my Canadian friends. Good evening, uh, Katrina. And um, uh, my cousin, uh, Mary, and my, my Aunt Mary, praise God are in the room so we can definitely jump into the word yeah emma stark is amazing yeah i've been i've been binging emma stark <laughs> you know um and so i i'm taking her 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 class prophetic authority so i think we're gonna do that together um the saturday group i think we're gonna we're gonna hang out with emma for a while and just get real activated and stirred up praise god um, all right, so grab your Bible um, and your notes from last week. We're going to jump into the Word. Bless the Lord. I've got kind of a sinus headache today. I don't know why because I eat like really clean. I've been, you know, working on losing weight. I've lost about, I think I've lost about 42 pounds. Ooh, 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 praise God. Um, I still got about 40 more to go <laughs> so to reach my goal, but something I, I don't know what I ate today but I've got a sinus headache so we'll see how long we can go um, today but let's pray father thank you for your presence thank you for your faithfulness to us blessed Holy Spirit you are welcome in this place um, we invite you to rend our hearts and implant deeply within us the word of life 
that we might be utterly transformed into the image of our Christ, that in all that we do and think and say, our lives might bring glory and honor to you and um, be impactful in the lives of others, that they might see you in us and through us and in spite of us and somehow be drawn into your embrace. Think through my thoughts tonight and speak through my words. Have your way, blessed Savior. You are worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all of the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Praise God. All right, guys. I got my Bible. I grabbed my old ESV. You know, if you're um, buying yourself a um, Christmas present this year, go to Evangelical Bibles. Get yourself a Skyler. Skyler. See, can you see how that's spelled? There you go. Um, this is for the serious, but you know, because these are these are not cheap Bibles. They're gonna cost you some money but they are worth every penny the paper quality the print the ink the leather i mean these are these are excellent bibles these are the kind that last you a lifetime the big fella is over there in the chair and i'm too lazy to get up and reach over there so we're gonna go with the esv i just got out of my greek class so my brain i gotta make the shift we have one more chapter to go, one more week, and we'll be through um, the beginning New Testament Greek, beginning New Testament Greek, which I have been reviewing. This is so much more intense than what I did, what I learned in seminary. Um, it's, it's excellent. And then the next level, the next class um, are the milestones where you start, we actually start reading um, in the New Testament. So I think the first class, the first book we read is 1 John. We read John's epistles and then we go on from there. So I'm really excited about that. And of course, all the revelation that I uncover, I will be sure to share with all of you. But you discover some interesting things um, um, when you read it in the, um, the Greek. Just real quick, like one of the verses we had to translate was um, happened to be in the book of Acts. Um, I'll just I'll just uh, share this with you because it jumped out at me today as we were, and then we'll jump into our notes. But I think it's Acts chapter. Uh, let's see, it's where Peter is preaching. And they say to him, yeah, oh, it's in Acts 2 and verse um, 38. Um, this is where the people ask Peter, where they say to him, um, brothers, what shall we do? You know, they, because Peter just preached this sermon to him. This is, this is the day of Pentecost. And so Peter says to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Pretty straightforward. But when you, when you read it in the Greek, um, the word repent and the word be baptized are in the imperative um, tense um, and the command form of the imperative. So when the people ask, like, what shall we do? Or, or you know, what, what must we do to be saved? The, Peter's response is not an optional thing. Oh, well, repent and be baptized. No, it's repent and be baptized. These are, they're imperative. They are commands. So you can't get around them. So anyway, it's, it's, it's little things like that that um, you see when you're reading it in the original language. So as I uncover precious pearls, I will share the treasure with you, beloved. All right. So last week we started talking about um, uh, overcoming 
um, demons and darkness. And we talked about how, because, you know, listen, there's a lot going on um, in the world, you know, today. Um, it's like America has sold its soul, you know, um, to the enemy, just sold its soul. When you look at, you know, the things and, and the enemy has a strategic plan to capture our children and our grandchildren because they are the future, you know, of this nation. So if you can convince them um, that like there is no God or that the scriptures aren't real or that even their gender identity is fluid and that you can change it if you want to, you know, that type of thing. Listen, that, that all comes straight out of the conference rooms of the kingdom of darkness. And um, so um, how do we overcome these things that are besetting many people that we know, even ourselves, the things that we struggle with? Um, how do we overcome darkness and overcome um, the, the, these demonic forces? Ministering deliverance to people because, listen, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ was meant to be a supernatural church, okay? That we, we should be the place where people come when they want healing, when they want salvation, when they need to hear from God, you know, um, we were meant to walk in the authority of his name, um, the, the power and authority of his spirit, and to do exploits in his name, um, you know, until he come, establishing his kingdom on earth until he come. So last week we talked about how um, Jesus came to save, um, and he, um, he not only came to save us, and all that that means, that sozo in the Greek, which which, which in its original language means healing, deliverance, restoration, resurrection. All of that is in that word that's translated as saved. He not only came to do that, but we established last week that he also came to destroy. To destroy what? He came to obliterate the works of the devil who held this world captive. Now, what does that say? about the church when the, this nation is sliding into darkness. What are we doing? There has to be a remnant that rises up that says, okay, enemy, you can go this far and no further. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so we looked at how Jesus proclaimed that the kingdom is here and that meant that God had arrived and he has not gone anywhere. Um, he hasn't like, you know, abandoned us or left us. He sent Holy Spirit to be the governor of the kingdom in the earth. Okay. And the good news became good news only for those who would turn from the darkness of the devil to the light of Jesus. But the good news of the gospel is very bad news for the prince of darkness. So we talked about how the devil's rulership came with term limits, how Jesus said that the things that he did, we should do, and even greater things should we be able to do because he goes to the Father. We looked at how the Son of God manifests himself through us today. And so um, our part of our job description is from that place of abiding in him, we are to release his powerful presence into the world where we live, okay? Allowing him to continue to destroy the works of the evil one until the job is complete, okay? And... Um, so we, um, we've, got, we've got stuff to do. This is why my home fellowship, and let me say this, um, usually on my page on Friday or Saturday, you will see like a, a thing that'll say, you know, the beloved, there's a new faith community forming. We gather on Saturdays at four. And if you cannot come, there's always a Zoom link on my Facebook page, you can join us via the Zoom link. You can be in the Zoom room while we gather. We usually worship. You want to make sure that you have communion just there at home, just sit on the side because we do take communion with each other as a covenant community each week. 
And we are reading through John's gospel right now because the Lord spoke to my heart when I was really, you know, praying about, Lord, I want to abide in you. I, I, I want to, you know, to not visit you. I want to abide in you. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, you need to hang out with John, live in John's books, because John understood the secret of abiding in the vine. John knew what it meant to abide in Christ. So we're reading his book, not just for information and not just for revelation, but we're reading so that we can receive an impartation of the anointing that was on John's life that is captured in the word. And I'll say this too, um, that John, hey, Justin, uh, how are you? Um, and um, I'll say this too, that John also understood the holiness and the fear and awe and reverence of God, which we know because we just studied verse by verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So John is the, is the one apostle who was caught up into the throne room of God and he saw the Christ that rules today and that is coming soon. And when he saw that Christ, that Jesus, he fell at his feet like a dead man. So John understood also the risen Christ, the King of glory. He understood the fear and awe and reverence of the Lord. So we're hanging out with John. Okay. That's on my, the Saturday group. And we're also just started, um, uh, doing a study on the prophetic and we're doing activations. We will be every week. We are stirring. We're going to provoke and instigate, um, the, the gifts um, because we want to abide and carry that into the world so that whether we're in line at Walmarts or in, at the bank or going through the drive through that the prophetic is stirred and quickened, that we have a word for people who need an encounter with the voice. Because listen, the Bible says that the angels, his servants, what do they do? They hearken to the voice of his word. So as we declare and decree and prophesy his word, the angels hearken to his word. And there is a realm that God wants us to not just visit or tap into, but to abide in as this end time church. Praise God. That's not in the notes. That's just on my heart. That was worth you tuning in just that little bit right there. Praise God. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. All right. Um, so where are we? Okay. So the son of God manifests himself to us today. This is our review. Therefore, we, 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 we minister from a place of abiding. In Matthew 3, we looked at how Jesus becomes an absolute threat to the powers of darkness um, then we looked at how um, the enemy um, uh, seeks entry points into our life. Um, absolutely, we're getting ready for a new year of glory, of, of, of walking with the Lord. Um, and so the enemy looks for entry points, okay? And when he finds one in your life, he tries to push that. He pushes that to try to see um, how he can um, gain access into our lives. He'll see how far um, we will let him go, how far he can get. And so, but James, you remember we looked at last week, James 4 verses 7 and 8 tell us that if we submit ourselves to God, then we can resist the devil and he will flee from us. He flees from the one who is submitted to God because you have power, authority, and help. You have an angelic host that helps. But if you're not submitted to God, you skating on thin ice, okay? 
So submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to us. Cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. Um, and so it goes on. So um, we looked at how, how when, we, when we do resist the enemy, he backs off for a season, but he'll wait for you to let your guard down. And when we let our guard down, he tries to get back in, and the battle is on. So we want to be equipped. So then we begin to look at, um, Jesus teaching and how he began to confront the powers of darkness and he commanded demons to leave and they left. They got um, gone in a hurry and Merry Christmas to you, Darren, and to your family, um, all my um, peeps up in the thumb area. And so he commanded demons and they left in a hurry. There was no magic formula, no prolonged coaxing. He, he completely submitted to the authority of his father. All he had to do was stand in that authority, give a word of command. And that's where we too want, if we abide in him, we too can give a command from that place of abiding and the enemy must submit. Okay. He didn't have his own agenda. That means we're not supposed to have our own agenda. He came to do the will of the father. We're supposed to do the will of the father. And so that's what he did. He went from city to city. And when he showed up, um, the rule of God was enforced. And so we looked at several case studies. We looked at um, the demoniac at the garrison. Um, and um, um, we looked at the child with the evil spirit. Now that's telling, isn't it? Um, particularly in this day and age, because children can be susceptible to demonization, even demon possession. Um, but the church has authority and power to set people free. Amen. We looked at the man with the unclean spirit. We looked at the story of the Syrophoenician woman's daughter. All of this is review. And then we looked at six different ways that evil spirits can be compelled to leave people um, by a command of faith through the laying on of hands or through the laying on of hands and the command of faith through anointing with oil or all three anoint the person with oil, the command of faith, laying on the hands by exposure to Jesus authority through verbal expressions of faith by means of prayer and fasting, prayer and fasting, prayer and fasting. That's something that we need to do. And listen, this year is drawing to a close. Let's get ready to uh, meet God in fasting, give him the first fruits of the new um, um, Greco-Roman type year, because we know the Hebraic year already started. But January is the new year for those of us on the Western calendar. Let's give the Lord the first fruits of this upcoming new year. Plan to fast. And I'll say more about that as the new year approaches. So, you know, you can do all kinds of things you know, to fast, but we need to do that. It strengthens us in the spirit. So as Jesus, modern day disciples, whenever we encounter um, evil, unclean spirits, we can use any of these means of deliverance. Okay. And um, this is just an overview. I mean, we could go into in-depth, like particularly if you're ministering deliverance to people, you know, there are those um, like you, you, getting people to confess and repent and renounce confession repentance renouncing the sin is imperative to people being set free confessing renouncing uh, confessing repenting renouncing forgiving and then it opens um everything um, um up for us to begin to help assist that person in um, being set free but the best defense we said is a good offense um um, so we said the question after baptism was no longer how to get a demon out, but how to keep them out through holy living. Um, oh, we talked about how the early New Testament church, the norm was to get rid of the demonic, um, when, when people, um, were converted, like between conversion and baptism, you wanted to get, see, we've stopped doing that in churches today, but we need to get back to it. There are some churches that do do that. There's a, a, a man who has a massive ministry, um, Hispanic 
a ministry. I can't think of his name fast enough, but they do that. They're set up when people confess Christ. Soon as people confess Christ, they immediately take them through a deliverance process um, before they're baptized. Get them, get them, get the house clean. Then they immerse them in a discipleship program so that they can keep their gates um, um, closed. I will, Darren. I'll tell my dad that you said hi. Um, okay. So, um, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12, we looked at that, about principalities, powers, rulers of this, the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. In other words, the enemy is strategically organized and he moves forward to try to um, take as much territory, do as much damage as he can because he knows that Christ is coming, his, his days are numbered. So we looked at how all evil powers have a legal right to exercise their authority in their realm. So this is why it's critical that we stay submitted to God and to God's earthly representatives. Our best defense is holy living. And so there are several passages of scripture there. Let's just look at a, a, a few of them. How about Jude? Jude is the book right before the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's one chapter. Let's look at verses 9 and 10, um, which says, but when the archangel Michael contending with the devil was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judge judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. It's just talking about how there's just some, there's some protocol when it comes to dealing with things in the realm of the spirit. It's not a game. Um, let's look at, there's several verses there in Peter. Let's start in um, 1 Peter um, 2. Let's just look at a few of these. 1 Peter 2 verses 14 <coughs> through 18. Um, Oh, this is just giving um, 1 Peter 2. This is uh, giving like some of the protocol that has to do with submission, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God. That'll preach. I need to preach about that soon because we've forgotten that. Honor the emperor. For us, that would be, you know, all those governing officials that we think are crazy. Um, scripture says honor them. <laughs> Uh, that'll preach too. Uh, servants be subject to your masters. It goes into all of that. Um, so it's talking about behavior because when our behavior is wrong, it, it puts chinks in our arm, weak spots in our armor. And the enemy will use those things to um, access our soul. Um, 1 Peter 3 goes into even the relationship between husbands and wives and parents and, and children, that type of thing. There's an order. There's an order. We want to we wanna live as godly people in a godly manner. We, we don't act like the world, essentially. So you have to read some of these passages of scripture so that you can uh, see for yourself what the standard is for a um, believer. And even um, there's even um, um, uh, uh, protocol that is, that is given to um, those who are leaders in the church as well. And that's in 1 Peter 5. I exhort the elders among you. Um, and it talks about um, uh, shepherd the flock of God. Um, not under um, compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. In other words, you don't exploit the people financially, taking advantage of them, you know, making them supply your lavish lifestyle while they're impoverished, that type of thing. There's protocol um, because it says that when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory. And it's just talking about how we should clothe ourselves and how we walk in Christ. Because when we violate these principles, we get chinks in our armor and the enemy can get through. Okay, your armor is weakened. All right. So this is where we ended, where we talked about how... Um, 
um, when you were born into the kingdom, you and I were born into a war zone. There's no demilitarized zone. So we need to learn how to engage effectively in spiritual warfare. So last time we ended saying, so what's this whole thing when we talk about demons or unclean spirits? Where do they come from? What is this? Okay. Well, let me just share with you three different views. There are three viewpoints. Okay. Um, so the body of Christ tends to, you know, come from three up three different strengths, but I'm going to tell you which one I think is, is accurate. There are some conservative scholars that say that demons are the fallen angels that fell with Lucifer in the rebellion. Um, since we just did uh, Revelation, let's, let's go back to Revelation 12 and verse 4. These are some of the passages that they, they try to use to support their standpoint. Um, Revelation 12 and verse 4. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Stars, of course, you know, is, can be a reference to the angelic host. And there are millions of them, okay, if not billions. So a third is a whole bunch, okay? And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. So there are some conservative scholars that say that demons are fallen angels. I don't, you know, and the, the Ezekiel passage also, oh, let's just look at it real quick. Ezekiel 28 and verse number 14 it says, you were an anointed, this is a reference to uh, Lucifer um, before he fell. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you, um, um, you were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire. You were talking about that Lucifer was a high ranking angel and um, he fell. And Revelation tells us that when he fell, he took a third of the angels with him. So there are some scholars who say that the um, demons are fallen angels. I don't, um, uh, I, I don't adhere to that perspective because the, when they fail, they still have angelic um, body types, okay? And um, they don't need a host to manifest, okay? Um, because they have uh, an, an, an angel bodies. Um, and scripture says uh, in the New Testament that the enemy can uh, transform himself and appear, you know, as an angel of light. So he doesn't look as distorted as he became in the fall, you know, so people can be deceived, but they don't need bodies to manifest. They have bodies. Okay. So that's one. Others say a pre-Adamic race existed between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2. And you'd have to take my class as in the days of Noah because I break all of that down. But uh, just a real quick synopsis in the beginning, Genesis 1, 1 says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And there's a period. Um, the, the scripture does not say how much time elapsed between Genesis verse 1, 1 and Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. It just says in the beginning, in the, in, in the dateless past, God, Elohim, created bara, the heavens, hashemayim, um, um, and the earth, ha'aretz. And, and so um, then it says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And so there, I do believe that there was a period of time that passed, and the clues are in the Hebrew. The scripture says the earth was, that word was, if, if you have a good Bible, um, like this one has a little note and it'll tell you that that word was in other places is translated as became. So you could translate Genesis 1 verse 2 as the earth became without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the, the other clues in the text are that um, the, the earth became without form. That is, um, 
uh, the word tohu and bohu, those two words, formless and void. And when you study scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, you'll see that the scripture says that God doesn't create anything tohu and bohu or formless and void that God spoke and it came to pass, you know? And so when something is all of a sudden chaotic and, and formless and void, and then something catastrophic had occurred. And also when you see darkness overshadowing something, it is a sign also that something has been judged, okay? So there are clues in the text, but there are those who want to add to that and say, well, that Lucifer ruled over a pre-Adamic race. And so when he fell, you know, there was this destruction and that's what the demons are. I don't buy that one either. <laughs> okay, that one, I don't buy that one either. You will find references to the fall of Lucifer in these various passages of scripture. Uh, like we can look at Isaiah real quick, Isaiah 45 and verse 18. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is God, who formed the earth and made it, he established it. Look at this, he did not create it empty, he formed it to be inhabited. So that word empty is the word tohu, that's the same word that's found in Genesis 1 verse 2. The scripture says that God didn't, doesn't create anything um, formless or void empty. He, he created it, you know, with, for the purpose of being inhabited. And then real quick, look at uh, Jeremiah. In other words, God didn't create the earth. Some people say he created it out of this chaos and this confusion. But then what they, then they have to answer the question, where did the chaos, what caused the chaos and the confusion? It just doesn't line up. So I don't adhere to perspective number two, but real quick, Let's look at Jeremiah 4. And this is another reason why I'm restudying the languages that I studied in my 20s. I'm um, in a biblical mastery academy and really in studying them in a much deeper level so that I can really understand all of the grammatical um, nuances. And uh, because, you know, it helps you to really see some of what appears to be missing um, in the English, unless you're in a, in a class with a really good uh, Bible teacher. And look at this, Jeremiah 4. I looked on the earth and behold, it was... Now, this is Jeremiah looking prophetically back in time. He says, I looked on the earth and behold, it was without form and void and to the heavens and they had no light. And so he sees the chaos and, the, and, the, and he sees the tohu bohu. He sees the darkness. Look at verse 24. I looked on the mountains and behold, they were quaking and the hills moved to and fro. Now, so if he sees all this, these things have already been created. So he's seen some destruction that came. I looked and behold, there was no man at that time. Um, because God had not created the Ha'adam yet. And all the birds of the air had fled. I looked and behold, the fruitful land was a desert and all its cities were laid in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. And so I personally think these were angelic uh, communities because you'll find if you take my class on As in the Days of Noah that... Um, um, Lucifer did have a domain over which he had angelic authority um, and he messed it up, okay? So I, I reject um, one and two, but so I, the perspective that I tend to adhere to is that demons slash unclean spirits are the disembodied spirits of the offspring of the fallen watcher angels that were referred to as Nephilim that were destroyed in the flood and subsequent judgments of God, okay? So let me say that again. I believe that unclean spirits or the demons that the church casts out under the authority of God with the finger of God are the, because real quick, um, there was a, a angels who in, in Genesis, this is the real short, quick version. Okay. Um, 
the in in Genesis it tells you that the watchers came down actually during the time of Jared um, um, they came down and they saw the daughters of men now what they wanted to there was a, a, a twofold agenda number one they wanted to pollute the bloodline so that the Messiah would not come forth because you remember when the man and the woman fall the Lord tells he tells the serpent the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent that was a prophecy regarding Messiah okay are you guys with me so the seed of the woman now we know that's prophetic because the woman doesn't carry the seed the man does the woman has the egg but God said the seed of the woman because it would be supernatural Holy Spirit would would um uh, come upon her and that which she conceived would be of God it would be God Emmanuel God with us God in the flesh okay so the enemy to keep that from happening needs to pollute the bloodline that's one um uh, defile the bloodline the other thing was that god gave the ha adam created in adam when i say ha adam i mean adam humanity the adam male and female he told them in genesis 1 to be fruitful and multiply remember they are created in the image of god and so they have the ability like god because humanity created in the image of god in the likeness of god they have the ability like god to replicate themselves so the angels were like listen because the angels are not in that uh, uh, category, okay? Um, so they wanted to get in on that and produce after their own kind. So they, scripture says they took the daughters of men and they begin to produce the Nephilim, the fallen ones, because now they're hybrids. They're not fully human and they are not fully angel they are a defiled hybrid and i'll have to redo that class again very soon um because i go in depth i don't have time to do that tonight but i go in depth to show you um using scripture um how what i'm telling you is 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 in the word of god okay the nephilim they were so now, so God, remember, comes, he sees all of this defilement and he says what regarding Noah? He said that Noah was pure in his, um, or righteous in his generations, meaning that Noah's family line had not been defiled by the, the the nephilim okay there was no nephilim in noah's dna okay so don't let me go down that bunny trail that that would just take me too long so noah was righteous in his generations it doesn't just mean he was a good man he was a good man but it was more than that his was a line through which messiah could come okay because the a the fallen angels had been busy polluting the earth and listen Jesus said that when he comes again, it'll be as it was in the days of Noah. Okay, I'm going to just let that float in the air <laughs> for a while. I can't, I can't help you with that right now. So demons, so when the flood came, you had people and you had Nephilim in the earth nephilim are the hybrids well when when the flood came and swept everybody that wasn't in that ark away <clears throat> the nephilim were destroyed in the flood as well right okay so the dis when when you die remember death from a hebraic perspective does not mean you cease to exist it means that your spirit separates from your body okay and so you have the the um the the spirits of these dead unrighteous who were not in the ark 
they go to Sheol, okay, to the holding ground for judgment, to the holding the the the, can, the container where where the, the their spirits were held, you know, pending the the judgment that comes in the end. Okay, but the Nephilim, they are not fully human, and they are not fully angel. They are unclean spirits, hybrids. The creation of the fallen angels, they are, they violate everything that God had intended. Are you guys with me? So these unclean spirits were in bodies because they're hybrids. So they need a means of expression. That's why they look for a way to have, they look for a host. Don't be their host. Okay. I hope you're listening. I, you know, we're going to do that class because that class goes in depth. We, we, we go deep. I, I, I show you, um, pictures that you're the, okay. Oh, don't let me go up that bunny trail. Okay. Anyway, the giants that really were in the earth, you know, they have found skeletal remains of giants. I mean, for real giants. Okay. So in, in other words, you can trust your by your Bible. Okay. So the difference between demons and fallen angels is fallen angels who are not chained in Tartarus presently inhabit the heavenly places. Well, what does that mean? Well, what that means is that when God judged the angels who left their first, okay, go to the, go to the book of Jude real quick. Uh, go to the Jew, Jude. Um, and, 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 and notice that Jude is strategically positioned right before the revelation of Christ. It's almost like your, your last warning, you know, before Christ, the King reveals himself. But look at this in Jude, let's go down to, um, let's start with verse five. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So look at, notice it says Jesus who saved them because it's talking about the pre-incarnate Christ, Christ the King who was on the throne prior to coming to the earth. So Jesus who delivered the, the, the Hebrew slaves out of Egypt afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. Okay. Verse six, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, all right, but left their proper dwelling. That means they left, I think another might be King James. It says they left their first estate. They left their sphere or their realm of authority and they entered into the natural realm, okay? They left their proper dwelling. It was proper for them to exist as spirit beings, but they wanted to, you know, um, replicate. And like I said, defile the bloodline. So look at it. It says, um, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So, and there are other passages of scripture, but this is just one reference that tells us that those angels that participated in the defilement of the human gene pool producing the Nephilim, the Lord took those angels and he chained them. Okay. They are in a dark prison. And listen, the book of Enoch used to be a part of the canon of scripture until one of the councils, church councils back in the 300s or the hundreds back there, removed it because they thought it was too deep for the average person to handle. But the book of Enoch, as well as the book of Jubilees and the Assumption of Moses, all of these different <coughs> ancient manuscripts give you details about some of these things. And we look at that in my class 
as in the days of Noah. We just can't do it in, in this context. But I just wanted to show you that those angels are chained in a prison in the heart of the earth um, underneath darkness called Tartarus. And so um, there's a difference between the angels who fail and the fall, the, 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 angel, the angels who fail, who participated in the taking of the, the women um, and the other angels who fail. Those who did not participate in that um, um, defiling the human gene pool, they're still just fallen angels and they are still out there. Okay, so look at this. Show it to me in the Bible. Okay, <laughs> Ephesians chapter six. Well, listen, you want to know that they're out there. All you got to do is turn on the news. <laughs> turn on the evening news, particularly CNN. Watch CNN. You'll see all the fallen angels manifesting that you want to see. Okay, look at this. Ephesians 6 and verse uh, 12. For we do not wrestle again. Okay, go back. Um, well, Paul here is saying, put your clothes on, put your armor on. Okay. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now he's getting ready to break it down for you. This is what his, his schemata, his methods look like. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, that person that's getting on your nerve, that, that institution, that there's, a, there's entities operating behind these things and through these things and through the people, okay? If they open their gates and let them inhabit the rooms in their temple, okay? So look at this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. This is Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians 6 but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic, cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil. So in other words, he's giving you ranks, the rulers, the exousia, the authorities, um, uh, the, the cos spiritual wickedness, cosmic powers, over this present darkness, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, okay? So they're out there inhabiting the heavenly places, the atmosphere around. Come on, can't you like, listen, you don't even have to be hyper spiritual. You can be driving through a neighborhood and you can just feel when the atmosphere shifts you'll know that you crossed a threshold, spiritual threshold, and that there's there's um, like a different type of demonic activity, you know, like in that area, like unclean spirits. You can look at the houses and the yards and the, the look in people's eyes, and you can just tell. If you've ever been to New Orleans, New Orleans, and how do you say it? New Orleans, into the French Quarter. Have you ever been in the French Quarter? Oh, walk through the French Quarter someday in the summertime and you'll see various levels of manifestation, okay? Anyway, just look in people's eyes. Um, uh, okay, real quick, let's look at, um, oh man, it is 8.30 already. <laughs> Where does the time go? Let's look at Matthew 12 real quick. I like Matthew, <clears throat> Matthew 12, verses 24 and 25. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. And so uh, right there, it's just a, a, a clue that's showing you that biblical people um, believed in the unseen realm and in um, ranks, you know, like princes, demon, you know, um, dark fallen angel princess. Matter of fact, you find that mentioned in um, the book of Daniel, the prince of Persia, that cities and regions and neighborhoods have regional and territorial spirits over them. You want to have the, the angels of God guarding and protecting and around your home, your car, your territory, okay? Because the spirit realm is real. 
So they have, they're, they're very powerful, these angels, whether they're fallen or they're the angels of God. They have their own bodies. We're talking about um, the difference between fallen angels and demons. Um, they have the fallen angels are very powerful. They have their own bodies and therefore they don't need to inhabit one. And so recall the angels who visited Abraham and Lot. Remember, remember that, that they and others in scripture, they looked like people, you know, they, they manifest like that. I personally am convinced that I have seen angels who looked just like people. And you don't usually realize that until after suddenly they disappear. They're gone and you're like, oh my God, you know, I was just talking to that. Where'd that person go? You know, so they have their own bodies. Um, then scripture, a uh, separate from that makes reference to unclean spirits. These are, I believe, the demons. These are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, okay? They're unclean because they are hybrids, and they seek out bodies to inhabit. Oh, I don't want to go down that bunny trail, okay? But think about it. Just think about, think about what the mark of the beast might be. If there's a way to alter the DNA so that people take on Nephilim DNA again, then you would be unclean and you would be beyond redemption. I'm just saying, I, I, I'm thinking out loud. Okay, I'm just saying. Then scripture makes a reference to unclean spirits. They seek out bodies to inhabit. Um, Let's see, I'm in Matthew, so let's flip forward to Mark. Let's look at Mark chapter 5, verses 11, 12 and 13. Mark 5, 12 and 13. Um, 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 um. Oh, this is where um, Jesus... Uh, comes to the man, this is an area of the Gerasenes or the Gadarenes, it depends on your translation. And um, look at, you start up at the top, verse two, a man came out of the tombs with an unclean spirit. Okay, so this man is demonized. He lived among the tombs. They, and supernatural manifestation, if they put chains on him, he would just break them because this was the demon um, manifesting. And, um, um, okay, he's bound with shackles, that type of thing. No, no one had the strength to subdue him. Day and night, he's crying out, cutting himself. That's, de that's demonic activity, okay? When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, so he, 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 seems to be a reference to um, the demonic spirit, okay? Um, he, he runs and he falls down, crying out with a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Um, for he was saying to him, Jesus was, t was speaking to the demon, tell the unclean spirit, telling it to come out of the man, you unclean spirit, okay? And um, Jesus asked, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. So in other words, there was a legion of demons, and that's like more than a thousand, I believe, in this man. And so that's a clue right there without going too deep into the ministry of deliverance. You know, you're, you are a spirit being, you have a soul, and, and they comprise the inner man and you live inside this body, okay? This house called a body. Your spirit in Christ is born from above. That's where Holy Spirit moves in. Holy Spirit and your spirit become one, but you have a soul, which is the seat of your mind, your will, your intellect, and your emotions. And, that, and your soul has many, many rooms, okay? Many rooms, you, we, could, we could call them files or rooms, um, 
that have doors to go in. Like, okay. Okay, like this is a file, okay? Consider this the door, and it would have a label on it. And you open it, and there's material inside. In this file, I've got New Testament Greek vocabulary. That's what's in this file. Then I could have another file. This file has more material in it, okay? These are two separate files. They, they have different material in them. And then you can have so many files that you have them in a file cabinet. And so you've got files and then you have separate drawers to the file. Are you guys following me? So if you open the door, anything that you touch, taste, smell, see, hear, or experience, those are your gates. They go into a file in your um, subconscious or in your soul, okay? And listen, anywhere there is brokenness, anger, unforgiveness, sin, darkness, the enemy can slip into the file. So this man, this man that, that says, um, who has this, this principal, this, you know, the, the main demon, the strong man, his, whose name was Legion, he said, because we are many. So there was lots of brokenness in this man's life. Who knows what his background was and how he got to that point. But <clears throat> um, he begged him earnestly not to send them out because Jesus was telling him, um, um, in verse eight tells you, Jesus was saying to the man, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. So the spirit is trying to resist having to come out. So he tells him, listen, he begs him, don't send us out of the country because they tend to be territorial. And that's what I mean by you can go into certain areas and you can feel that you can, you can see spiritually as well as in the natural because you'll see the manifestation. Come on. Oh, I mean, think about, look at what's, begin to look at what's happening in this country through different eyes. Okay. Anytime you have people who want you to think that they are sane legislators passing legislation that would remove parental authority to know what the school system is teaching your babies and they're teaching your children that they can change their pronouns, that, oh, little boy, you're, you're identifying as a little girl, or little girl, you're identifying as a little boy. You need to go through this sex chat. Those are, come on, people, you, you don't need a lot of help seeing that that is an unclean spirit. If you know, the, that's why you must read the word. You must read it. Read it, read it, read it, read it for yourself. You need to get a translation that you understand and read it for yourself. And you must get in a Bible-believing church with Bible-believing teachers. Ask the Holy Spirit to open your heart and, and mind and give you revelation and learn how to abide in the Holy Spirit. And I can remember even as a child, you know, uh, I mean, as a kid, like in in, in um, elementary school, like when back in the day when I was at the back and we went to Burnett Baptist Church, that's where I grew up. I can remember because I was saved, I had the Holy Spirit. There were things that the preacher would say. I didn't know why it wasn't right, but just the Holy Spirit in me knew that what was was like kind of pulling my spirit away from that. That's not completely right. What he just said, that's not, that's not the fullness of revelation right there. That's one of the reasons why when I went to seminary, I, I said, I, I have to learn to read the Greek and the Hebrew for myself so that I can see what, what the writer's intent as inspired by Holy Spirit really was. Okay. So, um, uh, let's see, where were we? So Jesus is dealing with this, this host of demonic spirits. 
and they want to go in because, and, and again, these are not fallen angels because fallen angels don't need a body. These are unclean slash demon spirits. Because How do you know? Because look, they look for another host and they say, send us to the pigs. Let us go into the pigs. Don't just send us out they, because they look for a host for expression. Okay, that's my whole point. All right. I know I took a lot of time on that, but I want you to, I want you to see the difference. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, oh, let's see. What is this passage in Luke 11? Luke 11, 24 through 26. Oh, um, look at this. This is a good one. Luke 11, 24 through 26. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through water. When the unclean spirit, this slash demon, has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and finding none. It says, I will return to my house or my host or my room, the place where I was living, where I could manifest essentially. Okay from which I came. When it comes and it finds that you done swept the house and cleaned it and put it in order, it goes and gets seven of its buddies, seven other spirits that are worse than itself because you cleaned it and swept it. But listen, beloved, if you don't fill it with the word of God and the spirit of God, give the Holy Spirit permission to permeate that room, then the enemy will come and try to get back in that area of your life. Are, are you following me? Okay. When it comes, finds that. So you got to do more than clean it up. You got to fill it with the word of God, fill it with the spirit of God. So remember, and I say this all the time, because this is something the Lord said to me years ago. He said, he showed me a picture of my heart shaped like a perfect cube. And he said, I want you to take my word and wallpaper the walls of your heart, the floor, the ceiling, the wall of your heart with my word. He said, so that if the enemy tries to infiltrate, come in through any one of your doors and come into that room, you will know immediately that it is not me because it will not align with my word. And then you can do what James said. You submit to God, submit to the word in you. You draw, you resist the enemy, drawing near to God, to the word of God. And the enemy backs up off of you. Okay. You guys got that? Man, listen, I'm telling you guys, we, we, we got to teach this in our churches today because the world <laughs> has lost its mind. Okay. And they are becoming, listen, we're moving to the point where when you begin to say that Jesus saves or that there's only one way to God, it will be considered hate speech. There are already people getting in trouble for offending. Oh, the hypersensitive, woke, right, left, liberal, you know, demonized left. <laughs> okay, okay. Come, come back, Bernie. I went somewhere. Okay, look at, look at this. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. Finding none, it says, I will return to my house. I want to get back in my file. I want to get back in that room from which I came. When it comes and finds the house swept and put in order, it goes, gets seven other spirits. And um, that's why people come into the church. Maybe they go through a process, oh, they get saved, but they don't be, they're not discipled. They're not living right. They go tipping back into the world. You, If you keep doing that, you'll end up worse, okay? And we've, 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 we've witnessed that in people's lives that we know. Okay. That, that they go get seven more spirits, seven spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than at the first. 
And he said, and as he said these things, a woman in the crowd, race, okay, it goes, and it goes, he starts talking about something else. But I wanted you to see the we're looking at the difference between an unclean spirit and a fallen angel. There is a different. Unclean spirits look for a place of rest. They they need a host. Okay. Jesus commanded <clears throat> that we cast them out, that you go through the rooms and you clean the rooms. Luke 10, 19, flip back one chapter, Luke 10 and verse 19. What does it say? It says, behold, I have given you authority, that's exousia, to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power that's dunamis, of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. So in Christ, as a disciple of Christ, when the Holy Spirit comes in, we receive authority, okay? Authority to resist, to um, to um, cast these, these spirits out, to tell them back up off, get out of my, get out of that room of my, that area of my life. You submit that area to God. Listen, so, and here's another thing that you should notice, that the fallen angels can fly, move about in that dimension in the heavenlies, but the scripture tells us, we, we, just, we just looked at it in um, chapter 11, that um, these unclean spirits pass through, or they roam about, look at um, uh, Matthew 12, and verse 43, Matthew 12 and verse 43, when the unclean spirit, this is the same passage, or say Matthew's telling the same story, has gone out of a person, it passes through, water this place of seeking rest. Okay, let's look that up in the Greek real quick, just because my brain now wants to know what it is. Matthew, uh, Matthew 12 and verse 43. Now when the unclean uh, akarthartos, yeah, that's the foul, when a foul, unclean spirit, okay, goes out of man, it passes through dierkomai, it travels, um, it means to walk. It travels, it passes through, it walks. Yeah, they 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 they're not like fallen angels. It passes through dia. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was right. All right. Um, so I could be wrong about that. They get around, but they can't get around like um fallen angels. Nephilim in the body or out of the body fear and despise Jesus Christ. They fear and despise Jesus Christ, and they fear those conformed into his likeness. See, John 10 and 10. I think John 10 and 10 is the passage that says, um, no, that must be, uh, that's a wrong reference. I'm not sure what my reference there is supposed to be. Um, okay, I'm not sure what my reference there. Uh, the, the, the fear and despise Jesus Christ. Yeah, the, the, the enemy, you'll see when Jesus showed up and he was, you know, doing what he did, ministering, preaching, teaching, the, those spirits would cry out because they, they feared him. They knew who he was. In Ephesians 6, we just looked at that. There's a hierarchy of fallen angels that are directing spiritual forces in the heavenly places while demons manifest in the world. On this realm, the principalities and powers are in heavenly places over territory and over region. And you got the unclean spirits are the ones. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. It's like you have your aerial force and you have your ground troops. The demons are like the ground troops and the principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. They're like your aerial forces, but they work together, okay? The spirits of the Nephilim, which are the serpent seed and its ideology, are still in the earth today, beloved, and we must contend with them, okay? So there is an apostolic and prophetic realm of anointing and impartation birthed and nurtured in the Lord's presence that we need to 
we must learn how to abide in. We must learn how to abide in God's presence. And we must learn how to recapture the awe and fear and reverence of the Lord because it is out of that place that we're able to release great victory. So it'll be as it was in the days of Noah. And we're going to have to pick it up right there because we are out of time. Okay, I'll highlight that and we'll pick it up next week. Uh, we will talk about as in the days of Noah. Um, it'll be as it was, but it'll be worse. And we're, we're getting there. Okay, because um, I don't want to just skip over those passages of scripture. I want us to actually look at them. But there's hope, beloved. There is hope in Christ because as the world gets darker, the glory of the Lord will rise upon us. Okay. So listen, you've been studying the word with Bernardine Wormley Daniels, and um, this is the Living Water live stream Bible study. So Terios Ministries Incorporated, it is my pleasure, it's my privilege to open this book and study the word of God with you. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I pray that he will lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I pray that he'll turn his face towards you, you know, so that you, you know that you're beloved um, in him. Read your Bible. Pray. Until next time, um, take care. Be safe out there. Um, stay in your seat in heavenly places, and I'll see you next time. I'll put in the comment section if you want to give, if you want to, um, particularly during this holiday season, if you want to give an uh, in-time gift, in end of the year gift to Soterios, we um, receive it. We do have some benevolence things that we will be doing for Christmas, and your giving helps to support that. God bless you, and I'll see you next time.